you everyone for coming today. I want to apologize. I've got this, oops, sorry, this little box that will not go away on the edge of my slide. So you'll have to put up with me as we go through the presentation. But like I said, thank you for coming. As Emily said, today I'm going to be discussing the brain's resident immune response to one insult in particular, and that is fetal alcohol exposure. So as we get started, what I would like to do is just to kind of give you an idea of where this talk will take us today. First of all, I'm going to have an overview of fetal alcohol syndrome, and this will include when it was first described, some of its diagnostic features, as well as its prevalence within the United States. Then as we move on in the talk, we will start to discuss one of the main model organisms that's used in studying fetal alcohol syndrome, which is the mouse. So we're gonna use a mouse model to study the human condition. And as I go through the rest of my talk, most of the research that I will tell you about has been done in this mouse model, including my own project, which I'll be telling you about today. And then finally, what we'll end with is just a little bit of preliminary data I've recently collected that will basically shape the rest of my graduate career. All right, so I want to start off by saying that it has been known for a long time. There's been an understanding that alcohol consumption during pregnancy can damage the child. And I know that we still have discussions today of whether or not it's okay for a mother who's pregnant to have the occasional drink. But I will say that it's been suspected for centuries that this is actually a bad thing. We have now found that the Greeks and Romans actually believed that alcohol consumption on the night of procreation led to damage of the future child. And a similar sentiment has been conveyed within the Bible itself. So if we look at the book of Judges, um, in the Old Testament, we see this phrase. But he said unto me, Behold, thou shalt conceive and bear a son. And now, drink no wine nor strong drink. Despite this fact, there, there was an early understanding that alcohol could affect the developing child. There wasn't a formal description of fetal alcohol syndrome, for the medical community until 1973. And it was in this year that two articles were actually published, both of which together described three diagnostic features of fetal alcohol syndrome. All right, so many of the children with fetal alcohol syndrome had abnormal facial features, as you actually see in this picture. So many children with fetal alcohol syndrome have small eye openings, a smooth upper lip, as well as they're missing the ridges above their upper lip. In addition, children with fetal alcohol syndrome often have central nervous system dysfunctions as well as growth deficiencies. Since 1973, when those first two articles were published, an additional 3,973 articles have been published on the topic of fetal alcohol syndrome. And through this research, we have learned much about how alcohol affects the developing child. However, I will say that there is still much that we do need to know and much that is unclear. However, three things are clear from this research. First, alcohol does have devastating effects on the developing child, which include cognitive and behavioral deficits as well as problems with brain development. Second, Fetal alcohol syndrome should be considered a major public health issue that has staggering economic strain within society. Just to kind of give you an idea of how much this syndrome costs, the CDC um, predicted in 2003 that caring for children with fetal alcohol syndrome in the United States that year would cost around $5.4 billion. And today it's estimated that caring for one individual with fetal alcohol syndrome throughout their lifetime could cost between one and four million dollars. In addition, we've also learned that prenatal alcohol exposure can cause broader deficits than what has been described, those three characteristics for fetal alcohol syndrome. And because of this, it creates a problem in diagnosing fetal alcohol syndrome. What we now find is not all individuals who are exposed to alcohol during their development 
actually show a complete set of the diagnostic features that are associated with fetal alcohol syndrome. And in fact, many of the features resulting from prenatal alcohol exposure are variable, both physically and behaviorally. And this is for several reasons. First of all, the um, deficit in the child can be caused by differences in the timing of alcohol exposure. So if we think about human development, there are three trimesters. And what, it's, what has been found is that if the mother drinks during the first two trimesters, that's where we largely get many of the facial dysmorphologies as well as the growth deficits. Then consumption of alcohol during the third trimester is largely responsible for some of the cognitive deficits that are associated with fetal alcohol syndrome. Although I will say it's not quite that clear cut, the trimesters do overlap to some degree. In addition, it's been found that many genetic factors actually influence how much the developing child is affected by alcohol. This is the genetic background of both the mother and the child itself. In addition, it's been found that the mother's nutritional status and her socioeconomic status can actually affect how much alcohol will influence the developing child. And therefore, since there is this broad range of developmental abnormalities that are caused by prenatal alcohol exposure, we now refer to prenatal alcohol exposure and the deficits that it causes as fetal alcohol spectrum disorders. And fetal alcohol syndrome is actually on the more severe end of those disorders. So by now, many of you are probably wondering, well, how prevalent is a fetal alcohol spectrum disorder within the United States, especially since I've referred to it as a major public health issue? To start to answer that, I'd like to tell you about a survey that the CDC conducted between the years of 2006 and 2010. During this survey, what they were doing was asking women who were pregnant whether or not they had drank within the past 30 days. And what they found was that 7.6% of women um, that were pregnant reported that they had drank within the past 30 days. And 1.4% of pregnant women reported binge drinking during their pregnancy. Now, binge drinking in this survey was defined as four or more drinks on one occasion. So I think what these numbers tell us is that it is still relatively common for a woman who's pregnant to drink in our society. And I would venture to say that these numbers actually underrepresent how many women drink while pregnant, namely because they don't want to admit to it due to the social stigma. As to how many individuals in the United States have fetal alcohol spectrum disorders, that is somewhat unclear, namely due to the fact that it is hard to diagnose these children because the outcomes of prenatal alcohol exposure are variable. However, the CDC does estimate that 0.2 to 2 individuals for every 1,000 born actually suffer from an FASD. And they also predict that there are three times more children with an FASD than fetal alcohol syndrome. Now, I will say once again, these are hard disorders to diagnose, and therefore these numbers are also probably underrepresenting how many children suffer from these disorders. And some agencies actually predict that the number is closer to one in every hundred births um, has a FASD. One of the last things I want to leave you with is that there's actually re um, regional differences in how many FASDs are present. And it's been found that these regional differences roughly correlate to regions that show more or less drinking. So those regions that show a higher frequency of drinking also show a higher frequency of fetal alcohol spectrum disorders. And this should be of special interest to us in Iowa, as well as anyone in the northern part of the Midwestern states, because we are actually within one of the highest binge drinking regions in the country, shown by the dark blue color. And also, as many of you might have seen, the University of Iowa has now been ranked number one as the party school in the United States. So this is a real issue for us, something that needs to be studied. All right, so much of the research which I've told you about so far, many of the things we know about how many women are drinking while pregnant and some of the different morphologies or um, defects in these children that were expressed or exposed to prenatal alcohol exposure have been undertaken or learned through surveys. 
okay? Surveys of women and their drinking habits during pregnancy. The problem with this is, again, due to social stigma, many of these women will deny or underreport the frequency and amounts with which they drink during pregnancy. And in addition, when we do get information from these women, it's often impossible to, number one, confirm the accuracy of the information that they gave us, the frequency with which they said they drank, and also the timing of which they drank. And if we cannot um, define those different drinking patterns, it's hard to say one drinking pattern leads to these different abnormalities in the children that result. So due to that, we need to find a model that is better organized or that we can monitor more closely. And because of that, researchers in the field of fetal alcohol syndrome have turned to the mouse model to understand the human condition. And there are several reasons why this mouse model has been chosen. In addition to be genetically defined and engineered relatively easily, mice also have a biology and genome that's very much like our own, making them a good model system. And following that line of thought, they often share complex physiological systems with ourselves. So these mice have endocrine systems, and especially for interest in this talk, they have immune systems and they have nervous systems. And not only do they share those systems with us, but they also share with us many of the common diseases that are associated with those um, systems, allowing us to easily study them. And finally, we've developed extensive and sophisticated technologies that allow us not only to analyze the genome of these animals, but also to manipulate it. And that becomes particularly important when we're trying to define what genetic backgrounds can lead to more severe effects of fetal alcohol exposure or less severe. All right, up to this point, most scientists using this model, this mouse model of fetal alcohol syndrome, have primarily focused on how alcohol affects neurons. That was the major question. And what I would like to do here in this slide is just to basically go through a bit of what scientists have learned about how alcohol affects neurons using the mouse model. First of all, scientists have begun to define the consequences of differences in the amounts of alcohol that the mother consumes during pregnancy and how that affects the child. They also are starting to define how timing of alcohol exposure during development affects the child, as well as they're starting to understand how different maternal risks can either add to or lessen the severity of fetal alcohol exposure. In addition, using the mouse model, what they have found is that in the brain, when mice are exposed in what is equivalent to the third fetal trimester, um, there is substantial neuronal loss due to alcohol exposure. And this actually makes sense, considering that many children with fetal alcohol spectrum disorders actually have a smaller brain on average than their peers. In addition, alcohol has helped us to understand the pathway through which alcohol leads to cell death. Um, what we've learned from our mouse models is that alcohol induces a form of cell death called apoptosis. And this is considered in the scientific community to be a form of cell suicide. So essentially what that means is the cell knows that it's damaged. It knows that it's going to die. So what it does is it goes through a very sophisticated pathway to hold itself together until some other cell can come and remove it from the brain. This is opposed to another type of cell death called necrotic cell death, where the cell literally breaks open and its contents spill into the rest of the brain, harming the peers in the surrounding regions. So as I said, much of the research up to this point has focused on how alcohol affects neurons. But new questions have been arising in the field, namely because as of yet, there is no treatment nor preventative measures available for lessening the severity of fetal alcohol spectrum disorders. And so some of those questions that are starting to be asked are how does alcohol affect the brain's resident immune system, which is likely helping to clean up the situation that's left behind by alcohol as it is. In addition, we're asking how does the immune system react to fetal alcohol exposure. At this time, what I'd like to do is introduce you to the brain's resident immune system. 
So many of you probably know a little bit about your own immune systems. It's composed of several cells, some of which are shown right here in the lower half of the image, right here. And what we know about this immune system is that it actually goes and helps to remove foreign agents, and if there's an injury, they help to resolve that injury. Now, unlike our general immune system, most of the brain's immune system is actually composed of one cell type, which is called microglia, and is shown here in this picture. Now, microglia are an interesting cell type, because unlike all other types of cells, that are in the brain, microglia are not derived from a neuroectodermal or neuroepithelial progenitor cell. So they aren't made in the brain. Instead, they're made outside of the brain with the rest of the immune system, and then they migrate into the brain during development. Now, once they get into the brain, microglia are very important for the development of the organism. Um, microglia are actually shown in this image up here in green, so you can kind of get your first look at them. And what they do during development is, number one, they help to maintain homeostasis within the brain's environment. So essentially what they're doing is they're helping to maintain an environment in which the neurons are happy. Secondly, microglia are involved in synaptic pruning. Essentially what this means is microglia are helping neurons make good connections with each other. And finally, microglia phagocytose apoptotic cells that are present in the brain during development. And once again, this is important because we know that apoptosis is a form of cell suicide that essentially helps to minimize any further brain damage. But if these apoptotic cells are left too long on their own, they will eventually rupture themselves and harm their peers. So microglia have to be efficient in clearing these dead cells out of the brain. In addition to helping in development, microglia are also important under pathological conditions that are present during development or the adult life. So many pathological conditions are associated with heightened levels of cell death, which I show in the picture as the blue neuron with the red X through it, okay? And those dead cells are going to release factors that microglia respond to. Microglia during normal conditions are highly branchy and ramified, and in response to these signals, they start to retract these branches and enter a rounded amoeboid state. All right, so this is termed activation of microglia. And in this state, microglia do several things. Number one, they go around and they phagocytose or eat up dead cells. And number two, they release factors into the environment that have several purposes. They can help to calm the environment that is under attack. They can help to bring other microglia to the region to help clean up dead cells. And they can also, I should say, there is too much of a good thing, some of them can actually become damaging when there's too many of them. And that would be, for instance, the inflammatory factors. And all of you know what inflammatory factors are. If you ever get a cut and it gets swollen, that's inflammatory factors at work. They're trying to create an environment for healing, but in excess, they can be damaging. Show your Iowa pride, the Iowa Hawk Shop, where Iowa shops. The ultimate collection of Iowa Hawkeye merchandise, gifts, and apparel. Help support the University of Iowa. All proceeds benefit men's and women's athletic teams and student programs. The Iowa Hawk Shop, where Iowa shops. Show your Iowa pride. Call 1-800-HAWK-SHOP or visit www.hawkshop.com.
a certain way of doing things. You'll see it in the determination of our students, in the classroom and on our fields, in the collaboration among our faculty that lead to great innovation and change, in the vision of our writers, artists, and doctors. Bringing the world to Iowa and Iowa to the world. It's the Hawkeye way. All right. So with that said, what I would like to do is to introduce you to the two questions that have primarily been the focus of my graduate research. The first question I wish to answer was, what is the timeline of cell death that I see in my mouse model of fetal alcohol exposure? And once I had defined that, my next question became, how do microglia respond to fetal alcohol exposure? Do they become activated? Remember, it would be important for them to become activated because in that state, they could potentially help to remove any dead cells that alcohol is induced, All right? But for right now, let's just start by looking at the timeline of cell death that I see in my mouse model. First of all, what I'd like to do is to introduce you to this mouse model. So I work with a mouse model called an acute model of fetal alcohol exposure. And essentially what this means is that the mice are exposed to alcohol only over a very short period of time. And what I do is I actually inject um, seven day old mice with five milligrams per kilogram alcohol. Now I'm gonna stop right there because I'm sure many of you are already asking the question, okay, you are injecting a mouse that's already been born with alcohol, how can that help? Because we know fetal alcohol syndrome is caused when a pregnant mother drinks alcohol. Now, if you think back a little bit, I said that it is during the third trimester of a child's development that the brain is most susceptible to alcohol's effects. For the mouse, the equivalent time period of brain development is actually seven days after birth. So the mouse doesn't finish its brain development until after it's been born. And that's why I'm injecting mice that are seven days old. Okay, so at seven days old, they have brain development equivalent to the third human fetal trimester. All right, so when I inject these mice with alcohol, what you'll notice is that the blood alcohol level rises significantly and it stays above a toxic threshold for several hours. Now what this toxic threshold is, is essentially a blood alcohol concentration that has been previously defined in mice to, at that level, cause cell death. So if you get over that threshold, you're causing neuronal cell death in the brain. And at that point, as I said, you've got neuronal death. So what I'd like to show you is what that neuronal death looks like. And I wanna start by showing you a mouse brain, okay? So this is the side view of the mouse brain that you're looking at. And if I cut a section through that mouse brain and now turn it to face you, what you'll see is a section that looks kind of like this or this, okay? So if we look at a section through a brain from an alcohol exposed mouse versus a um, saline control exposed mouse, what you'll notice is that there's a significant increase in cell death in my alcohol exposed mouse as represented by all the little black dots in the image. And what you'll also notice is that this cell death is present throughout the brain. However, for my research in particular, I'm interested in one part of the brain, and that's called the cortex, which you see here kind of lining the outside of the brain, okay? And as we go through and we look at pictures of cell death, we're gonna be looking at one small portion of the cortex, which I've outlined here in this red box, okay? So we're gonna be looking just lateral to what we call the cingulate gyrus, the cortex. All right. So just to remind you, what I wanted to do first was to look at the timeline of cell death in my mouse model. And to just orient you to begin with, what I wanted to do was bring up our picture of cell death in the brain once more, just to show you where our pictures are gonna be located. So as you'll notice up here, the cortex has several layers, two of which are lab labeled layer two and layer four. 
And when you're looking at images, they're going to be essentially where this little red box is up here. So layer two will be at the top of the images and layer four at the bottom. So let's just take a look at the pictures to start off with. Once again, layer two is at the top, layer four is at the bottom, all right? Now as to the layout of these pictures. So what we see first is a 12 hour control. And what that means is that I sacrifice the animal 12 hours after being exposed to a saline control. So presumably what this animal is gonna show us is what's happening in normal development. I've also got a 96 hour control at the end of my panel of images. Now in the middle, what we see are animals that were injected with alcohol and sacrificed 12 to 96 hours later. All right, so now that we have that general information, what I'd like to go through and actually tell you what's going on in these images. So the blue color that you see in these images is a marker of early cell death called cleaved caspase 3. And when we compare what we see in our 12 hour control to what happens at 12 hours after alcohol exposure, what you'll notice is that there's a significant increase in cell death 12 hours after alcohol exposure when compared to what you would see in a normal animal. And as we move forward in time, you might see some of these little blue dots. That's mainly debris. But what we see little of is these larger cleaved caspase 3 positive structures. Okay, So what we have here is little cleaved caspase 3 positive cell death. So what does this tell us? Well, as I said, cleaved caspase 3 is an early marker of cell death. So what this tells us is that alcohol is still inducing cell death at 12 hours after the mouse has been injected. However, it's causing little cell death at 24 hours, and it's no longer causing cell death after that. Now, if we are going to monitor how long these dead cell cells stay in the cortex, we're going to have to find another marker of cell death that sticks around longer. Cleave caspase 3 is only around for a very short period of time. So I chose a marker of cell death called PSV which we now see here in red. So all of these little red dots are PSV labeled dead cells. And what we see is when compared to our 12 hour control, 12 hours after alcohol exposure, we're already seeing an increase in dead cells in the cortex. And there's a further increase as we move from 12 to 24 hours after alcohol exposure. Now, as you may remember, where cleaved caspase 3, our early marker of cell death, was primarily located was at 12 hours after alcohol exposure. So what I would put forward to you is that the reason we see an increase in um, PSV-labeled cells from 12 to 24 hours is those early cells, those cells in the early stages of cell death, are now going into later stages of cell death and are being labeled with PSV, which we can now see here, right? And as we move forward in time, 48 and 96 hours after injection, what we notice is that most of those dead cells are no longer in the cortex. Now they should still be there unless something came along to remove them, okay? And we're gonna talk a little bit about that soon. All right, what I wanted to do finally is just to overlay those two channels of cell death for you. Once again, we see a lot of cleaved caspase 3, our early marker of cell death at 12 hours after alcohol exposure, telling us that alcohol is still causing cell death at this time. And as we move to 24 hours, we see an increase in PSV. So these cells that are in the early stages of cell death are now moving into the late stages of cell death. And finally, what we see at 48 and 96 hours after alcohol injection is that most of those dead cells have been removed from the cortex. All right, so what we've done now is to define a timeline of cell death within my mouse model of fetal alcohol exposure. What I wanted to do now was to ask the question of how do microglia respond to fetal alcohol exposure? Do they become activated? Because if so, they could possibly be the cells that are removing our dead cells from the cortex, all right? But before we get ahead of ourselves, let's just first ask the question, do microglia become activated? All right, so what we're gonna do now is actually to look at microglia. All right, so we have in our possession a mouse line that expresses a fluorescent protein in all microglia, okay? So when you're looking at these images, all of the little white dots are microglia in the brain. Now, when we're looking at these images, we're looking at something slightly different than what we were before. So if we look up at the top here, 
what you'll notice is my little red box has changed. Instead of just encompassing layers two and four, it goes through the entire expanse of the cortex. So now, the top of the cortex is at the top of the images, the bottom of the cortex is at the bottom of the images, okay? And layer four is now kind of in the middle of the image. All right, so once again, we're gonna look at our saline injected controls first. These, once again, presumably tell us what happens during normal development. And what we'll notice is that the density of microglia increases as the animal develops, okay? This is largely due to the microglia replicating or dividing and thus an increase to their population size. The other thing I'd like you to notice when looking at these images is that the microglia are actually relatively evenly distributed. They are territorial. They like to stay as far apart from each other as possible. Now, in contrast, when we inject animals with alcohol and look at microglia in the brain, what you'll notice is that now, microglia aren't distributed as evenly. We still see an increase in density as we go through development, but now there seems to be an increase in density of microglia within the middle of our images. And in some areas, microglia actually look more sparse, like they've cleared out. Now, this is very interesting considering microglia seem to be congregating in the same layers where we see cell death in the cortex, all right? So perhaps microglia are doing something about these dead cells. Now, as you remember, maybe back to the beginning of the talk, one of the ways we can tell whether microglia are becoming activated is that they change in appearance. They go from a branchy state to a rounded state. And I will say that's a little hard to see in these pictures. So what I would like to do is take you in for a closer look. And what we're going to do is we're actually gonna look at microglia within the red boxes that I've defined here. And so when we go to the next slide, what you'll see is images of microglia in the cortex, and now layer two will be at the top of the image, and layer four of the cortex will be at the bottom. All right, so these images are laid out like before. We've got controls at the front and the back, and then in the middle are our animals that were injected with alcohol. And what you'll notice is in our 12-hour control, microglia are quite branchy. They have lots of extensions. However, if we look 12 hours after alcohol exposure, what we notice is those microglia have fewer branches, and if they do have branches, they look somewhat shorter. And finally, if we move forward to 24 hours, and especially look in layer four here, what we notice is that the microglia are very rounded, okay? This is indicative of activation. Now, if we move forward in time, what we notice is that microglia seem to redistribute, re-extend their branches, until 96 hours after alcohol exposure, when we see our animals looking almost identical to what we see in the controls. So it appears over a span of 96 hours, our microglia activate and then deactivate. All right, so as to our question, do microglia become activated? Well, they at least show morphological changes that are consistent with activation. However, being a scientist, that wasn't enough for me. I had to ask, is there another way that we can see whether or not microglia are becoming activated? So do they show other signs of activation? Now, what I have up here are just zoomed in images of layer four of the cortex in our microglia. So 12, 24, 48, and 96 hours after injection, just so that you recall the morphological changes they go through after alcohol injection. And what I haven't told you up to this point is in addition to undergoing morphological changes, microglia also change in gene expression as they become activated. So as microglia go through activation, so they become rounder, but they also change the expression of some genes. They increase the expression of one gene, which is an integrin called ITG beta 2, and they decrease the expression of a purinergic receptor, P2Y12. All right, so if this rounding effect that we see is indeed activation, we should say, see those same changes in those markers if we look. So what I did was to look at the expression of those markers using qPCR analysis. And just to get you set up as to what we're looking at, we've got our four time points, and for each of those time points, we have a saline control represented, as well as our alcohol injected animals. And we're always comparing expression of our two genes in the alcohol animal 
relative to our saline injected control, right? So let's look at ITG beta 2 first. It's supposed to go up with activation. And that's what we see. If we follow the gray column, we see that it goes up as microglia round up. Then if we look at P2I12, which is the purple column, we see that it goes down just like it's supposed to. So it appears that microglia are becoming activated. Now, if they're deactivating from 48 to 96 hours, what should happen is that those two markers should go back to levels that we see in the saline injected control. And that's what happens. ITG beta 2 goes down and P2I12 goes up, right? Now, those are just two markers of microglial activation. You might recall that when microglia become activated, they often also express inflammatory factors. And so I just looked at a couple of those as well, interleukin-1 beta and TNF-alpha. And if microglia are becoming activated here, then we should see them go up, which is what we do. And as they deactivate, those inflammatory factors go back down to saline control levels. So in addition to saying microglia show morphological activation, we can also say that they undergo molecular changes that are consistent with activation. Now, all of this is interesting, but the thing I really wanted to see was if these microglia are becoming activated, are they actually cleaning up dead cells that are left behind by alcohol exposure? That would be really cool if they were. Now recall, in their activated state, microglia do tend to become phagocytic in other models. So I asked the question, do microglia become phagocytically active in response to alcohol-induced cell death? All right. So what I did here was to look at a marker of lysosomes in the cortex. And some of you might be wondering what a lysosome is. Essentially, the lysosome is like the stomach of the cell. If a cell is going to eat another cell, it's going to have, something, have to have something to digest it with. So that's what the lysosome is for, and that's what CD68 labels. Now what we're looking at here is once again our saline controls, and what you'll notice is the top of the image is the top of the cortex, the bottom of the image is the bottom of the cortex. So we're looking at the entire expanse once again. And what you'll notice is there's a basal level of these white dots, which is our CD68, the marker of lysosomes. And the other thing you'll notice is that they're relatively evenly spaced, like microglia. Now in contrast, when we look at animals that have been injected with alcohol, what you'll notice is that the intensity of this staining goes up from 12 to 48 hours, so it increases in expression. And not only that, but we see a very, very large increase in expression right around the middle of the cortex and to some degree right up here in the top. And that's interesting because once again, that is where we're seeing cell death in the cortex. Now this makes sense. If cells in the vicinity of that cell death are going to eat them up, remove them from the cortex, we would expect that they want, want to increase the equipment with which they need to do so, right? Now, I wanted to know, is it in fact microglia that are expressing this CD68? So what I want to do is just take a closer look of, at these alcohol-injected animals. So that's what we're going to do now. If we go and zoom in to layer four to look at that CD68 expression, this is what it looks like right here, okay? So this is a closer up version of layer four. Now, if we also look at microglia that are present in that region, what you'll notice is that the microglia seem to be in locations where we see CD68 expression. And what I've done for you all is to create an overlay of those two channels. So wherever you see yellow, that's where CD68 expression overlaps with microglia, okay? So what we notice here is that microglia seem to be the ones expressing CD68, and they seem to be coming, becoming phagocytically active after alcohol exposure, right? Now, this is all fine and dandy. They have the equipment to eat dead cells, but it's an entirely different matter to actually see them eat dead cells. And so that was what I wanted to do next. I wanted to see whether or not I could actually identify microglia eating dead cells. So once again, here's the timeline of cell death that you saw before. And what I'm going to do to these images is to overlay microglia, okay? Now what I did was I went through and tried to find any microglia that looked like it had surrounded a dead cell. And I went through and circled some of those for you guys.
So it does appear that I can find microglia eating dead cells. However, I noticed that that was probably a little bit too small for you to see. So what I did was to increase the size of some of these images, right? And what we'll notice here is anything that's yellow or red, that's our dead cells. And they just change color depending on whether or how microglia are associating with them. Now what you'll notice is often microglia are extending processes around these dead cells, and some of them actually have dead cells within their cell body. So this cell right here, this microglia, has eaten three dead cells on its own. And that's quite common. They will go around and just keep eating and eating. Now, I was very interested in this, and I just wanted to understand a little bit more about how microglia are associating with the dead cells after alcohol exposure. So what I'm showing you now is kind of a zoomed in image of layer four of the cortex after alcohol exposure. And what you see here is once again, our early marker of cell death, cleaved cast phase three in blue, and our late marker of cell death, PSV in red. And what you'll probably notice is that those cells that are labeled with um, cleaved cast phase three, they still look like neurons. They stay, still maintain most of their structure. They have a cell body and a dendrite. In contrast, if we look at those cells that are labeled with PSV, they're much smaller and more compact. And this is actually very common of the apoptotic cell death pathway. They go through this transition. And what I did was to actually take several of these cells up in this larger image and to lay them out for you so that you could more easily see the progression of cell death. So what you'll notice is as our cells begin to express cleave cast phase three, they have a relatively intact structure still. And then they start to break themselves up into little pieces so that they're easier to be cleared from the cortex. Finally, as they start to express PS view, they start to round until they're very small and compact. Now, what are microglia doing during this time? Well, I would like to show you. Well, it seems like microglia like one type of dead cell over another. They don't really seem to associate it with our early stage apoptotic cells, but they seem to love any cell that has PSV labeling, okay? Now, this is really important, and I would say that microglia are very smart in this distinction. So, as I told you before, if an apoptotic cell remains in the cortex too long, eventually it can't contain itself, it'll rupture, it'll hurt other cells in the surroundings. So microglia are going to want to clean up those cells that are in the late stages of cell death. Now, in addition, another thing about cleaved cast phase three is that if a cell is really stressed out, it can express cleaved cast phase three, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to die. It can recover itself. So a microglia is not going to eat a cell that's labeled with cleave cast phase three. It's gonna eat those cells it knows are dead. Tradition, mm -hmm. ambition, exploration, inspiration. You feel it when you step on campus at the University of Iowa. The energy and pride of students inspired by our history and excited about our future. When you join the Hawkeye family, you're a part of it all. Be a part of it. Be a part of it. Be a part of it. Be a, of it. Be a Hawkeye.
Iowa pride, the Iowa Hawk Shop, where Iowa shops. The ultimate collection of Iowa Hawkeye merchandise, gifts, and apparel. Help support the University of Iowa. All proceeds benefit men's and women's athletic teams and student programs. The Iowa Hawk Shop, where Iowa shops. Show your Iowa pride. Call 1-800-HAWK-SHOP or visit www.hawkshop.com. All right, so we've shown that microglia show morphological activation. They look like they're changing gene expression with activation. And not only that, but we can show that they eat dead cells. So as to our question, do microglia become activated? I would say at this point, we can say yes, all right? Now, one thing we don't know yet is, okay, so microglia are becoming activated. Are they responding to the alcohol itself? or are they responding to the neuronal death that the alcohol induces? From the data I've shown you so far, we can't really tell. And so if we're going to answer this question, we're going to have to do one more experiment. All right, previous research has shown that alcohol induces neuronal cell death through a very specific pathway, and that's called the intrinsic apoptotic pathway. Now, this pathway is primarily characterized by a protein called BAX, which is so shown right here. So presumably, if we could get rid of this protein, then we could also get rid of the cell death pathway through which alcohol works and basically prevent cell death in the brain. Now, lucky for me, we actually had a mouse line in my lab um, that was like this, that did not express BAX. So here is an animal that is a back knockout. It does not have an intact apoptotic pathway. And here's an animal that does express back, so it can undergo apoptosis. And what we notice, if we inject both of these animals with alcohol, what we see is cell death initiate in our normal animal, but no cell death in the back knockout. Now, these are the cortical images that you're used to looking at. I also included a picture of another region of the brain called the hippocampus basically to show that regardless of where alcohol induces cell death, if there's no BAX around, no cell death will be present. All right, so back to our question. Do microglia respond to alcohol or to the death it induces? We can use this mouse line to begin to answer that question. So as we go through the next set of data, our BAX wild type animal, so the one that has an intact apoptotic pathway, our normal animal will always be on the left, and our back's knockout animal will always be on the right. So what I would like to do now is to just zoom in to layer four here of the cortex and look at microglia morphology. All right, so if we look in our normal animal, after alcohol exposure, microglia round up relative to the control, suggesting they're becoming activated. However, if we look at the back's knockout, the microglia are still very branchy after alcohol exposure, much like what we see in the control. So they don't appear to undergo activation in the absence of cell death, at least morphologically. We can also look at whether or not they become phagocytically active. When we compare our wild type animal that increases CD68 after alcohol expression to our Bax knockout, what we'll notice is that it doesn't upregulate CD68. So apparently microglia are not becoming phagocytically active either. And finally, if we just look at markers of microglial activation, our ITG beta 2 and P2Y12, while ITG beta 2 normally goes up, P2Y12 down, we don't see this in our back's knockout animal. So at this point, we can say, well, unless there's cell death around, microglia don't look like they're becoming activated. So it must be the alcohol-induced cell death that they are responding to. All right, so that's primarily what my research has been composed of during my past four years, starting my fifth year here. And what I would say is, with all of this data, we can safely say that microglia are reacting to alcohol-induced cell death, becoming active, and clearing dead cells to at least a degree. And what I would like to do here with the last part of my talk is just to show you a little bit of preliminary data that I have collected to look at whether or not microglia respond the same way if alcohol exposure is extended. Remember, we were looking at acute alcohol exposure before,
Now, if we look at extended alcohol exposure, this is called a model of chronic alcohol exposure. And what we would expect to see is an extended period of cell death, which microglia would have to respond to. So what I wanted to do first was just to determine my timeline of cell death in this model, as I did before. And what you'll notice is, once again, layer 2 is at the top of the image, layer 4 is at the bottom. And whether I inject on P7 or P8 and sacrifice 12 hours later, essentially what I get is an increase in cell death in the cortex. Now, as I said, for a model of chronic alcohol exposure, what you're doing is extending your alcohol exposure. So what I'm going to do is now inject my animals on multiple days, not only on P7, but also on P8, so like you see here. And what I found is when I did that and sacrificed at the same time as my P8 injection alone, is that I saw less cell death than when I just had a P8 injection. Now, this was a bit strange, and when I compared this to an animal that had only been injected on P7 and sacrificed at the same time, what I found was the level of cell death in my double-injected animal looked similar to what I saw just with a P7 injection. All right, well, this, I have to admit, slightly confused me. It seemed like instead of getting an extended period of cell death, instead what I saw was that the second injection seemed to have no effect. Okay, so I had to ask the question, well, perhaps I killed all the cells that I could with my first injection, and there was nothing left to kill with my second injection. Now, if this is the case, regardless of where I put my second injection, I should never get cell death. Okay? So what I did next was to actually move my injections. So instead of having them 24 hours apart, as I did before, I moved them closer together. Now they were only 10 hours apart. And once again, with this theory that I killed all the dead cell or all the cells I could with my first injection, even if I move these two injections closer together, if that's the case, I shouldn't see, or I should see cell death levels that are similar to what I see here. Okay? So just as our controls, if we just inject once and sacrifice, several hours later, what we see is a minimal level of cell death. If we move the injection 10 hours later and sacrifice at the same time, now we see our cell death. And now, if we do the double injection, 10 hours apart, what you'll notice is my level of cell death here looks similar to this injection alone. Okay? So what does that tell us? Well, first of all, it seems that this first alcohol injection right here does not kill all the cells that it possibly could. Okay? We can still get cell death with a second injection. So what this data says to me is that perhaps the first injection is protective against one 24 hours later. Okay? I'm going to call this preconditioning. So it has a protective effect against another injection. However, this protection is not infallible. In fact, it is not in place as early as 10 hours after the injection. Okay? So obviously, what I wanted to know after that point was what could possibly be conveying this protection. And so what I did was a genome-wide analysis of gene expression within my alcohol mouse and my saline injected mouse. Essentially, what this would allow me to do is look at all of the genes that are expressed in the cortex of my alcohol injected mouse and compare all the genes that are expressed in my saline injected mouse. Now, that gave me thousands of genes to look at. But I was particularly interested in one group of them called the growth factors. And the reason I was interested in these genes is because they've been previously shown to have a protective effect in the brain. Now, there are several family members of growth factors. That's not really important. But what I will say is that one of these growth factors really stood out to me, brain-derived neurotrophic factor, BDNF. And I will say it wasn't just because it is so much higher upregulated than its peers, but also because it's significantly upregulated 24 hours after alcohol injection, which is when I see my protective effect in my double injection scenario. But it's not significantly upregulated at 12 hours, which is approximately when I don't have my protective effect. So what I will say is now I have a candidate for what could be causing this preconditioning, BDNF. And with that, I have several questions. What cells are expressing BDNF? Where and when is BDNF expressed? And is it indeed required for the preconditioning that I see? 
And I have to say, these questions are definitely going to keep me occupied with my remaining time here. And what I will say is I've already begun to answer some of these, or start to answer some of them. And what I'd like to leave you with here is just some data that I just got Friday, actually. Um, what I did was I looked at BDNF expression in the brain. So here's my saline injected control up here at the top, and then an alcohol injected animal at the bottom. And BDNF is shown as purple. And what you'll notice in the cortex is it has very defined regions of cell death. And I don't have any clue what that means right now. I'm sure that'll keep me occupied for a while. But I thought it was cool and wanted to show you. So with that, what I'll leave you with is just a slide to pull this story together. So what I told you is at the beginning of the talk is that FASDs convey devastating lifelong defects in cognitive cap capabilities to the de developing child. And unfortunately, there's no treatment nor preventative measures to lessen the severity of these FASDs at this point. I've also told you through my own research that microglia become activated by alcohol-induced cell death, and they're important in clearing dead cells out of the cortex. Now, something else I didn't tell you about is it has been previously shown that microglia express BDNF, so they might be the cell type that is leading to BDNF expression, which I'm so interested in. And finally, what I hope is that by understanding how microglia respond to fetal alcohol exposure, maybe in the future we'll be able to optimize their response to the cell death and induces, and thus create some form of treatment for FASDs. And with that, I would just like to thank everyone that has helped me in this process and to take any questions that you might have. Oh, sorry, Andrew. <laughs> So there is still controversy over whether or not they're dying. There are some articles in the cerebellum that show microglia also die after fetal alcohol exposure, but I can personally say that I have not seen one die yet in the cortex. So it could be that it's a regional thing in the brain. Some microglia are more susceptible than others. I will say that while microglia are present throughout the brain, there are subtypes. They're not all exactly the same. Um, actually, back there. Yeah, so they actually lack the Bax protein, and without that protein, alcohol can't start the cell death pathway. Uh, well, they do, yes. So just because they don't have Bax does not mean they don't have everything else that they require to get drunk. And actually, I will say with pups, usually what that entails for them is passing out and just laying there for about an hour. So, but yes, they still do. Um, yes, humans do express backs. Mm -hmm. um, well, if you get rid of backs in a human, then they also won't express cell death. Um, I don't know of any human mutations that are like that currently that are being studied, but it is possible, I suppose. Andrew, did you have another question? <laughs> uh, your um, it was, I isolated the cortex and um, used that. So I was only looking at gene expression in the cortex. Mm -hmm.